Mary Doria Russell wrote a book entitled A Thread of Grace. In this story, they t- she tells of the story of a group of Jewish refugees who were making their way safely into Liguria, uh, Italy, which is in the northeast uh, region uh, and is on the sea of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And what they did not know when they were headed there for uh, for protection that Mussolini had surrendered Italy to Hitler and Jews then were no longer safe anywhere, but especially there. Terrible struggles took place, and in the death throes of World War II, Hitler's officers attempted to bomb and capture, and if capture, then to export to the death camps, or even to kill there when they found them, these some 40,000 plus Jews who were seeking refuge. They wondered why it was that these Italian peasants and priests among them, who were good people, were selflessly sacrificing their lives and taking great risks to protect them. In a reflective passage toward the end of the novel, Russell records a rabbi wondering this very question, saying in her writing, there is a saying in Hebrew that says, no matter how dark the tapestry God weaves for us, there always is a thread of grace. People all over Italy have helped us. Almost 50,000 Jews have been hidden. And I keep asking myself, why? What is so different about these people here? Why are these Italians helping so many of us when they could have so easily turned away? She writes that the rabbi shrugs his shoulders and turns away and walks away. But I suspect that the rabbi answers his own question when he wonders, why would they risk so much to help us? When he made that statement that was the Hebrew proverb, if you will, no matter how dark the tapestry God weaves for us, there's always a thread of grace. The answer to his own question as to why these people did it is just that, grace. No matter how dark the tapestry of life may seem, there is always a thread of grace. There are, it would seem, dark days around us right now. In so many ways, it's unfortunately so easy to turn on the news or read the paper or listen to the radio or experience firsthand the darkness of the world around us. But I want to encourage us to know that there is always a thread of grace. So let me ask you the question, what is grace? That's one of those churchy words that we use sometimes. We throw it around, we exchange it, I preach about it, we teach about it, we talk about it. But for those who are nominally religious or irreligious, non-religious people, and maybe even for some of us here who are faithful followers, Grace is a hard thing to think about or to know what it really means. Sure, we can use some acronyms like grace being God's riches at Christ's expense, which is kind of nice and does begin to explain a little bit of what it is, but that can also be confounding or puzzling at times. A a prominent Old Testament word describing God's grace is chesed, which is a word that speaks of deliverance from enemies, affection, or adversity, or affliction or adversity. It also denotes the ability to have daily guidance, forgiveness, and preservation in our walk each day. There's a New Testament word that is uh, symbolic or is grace, and that is this, and is haras, and it focuses on the provision of salvation. So you may be asking yourselves, so what does it mean? Now, see, I have to use those Greek and Hebrew words because I went to seminary and paid a lot of money for that education, so I'm going to use it. (laughs) But I also think it's important for us to understand that these are deeply uh, rooted in our own faith, in the Word of God, both a Hebrew and a Greek, an Old Testament and a New Testament idea, and that is of God's grace. So what does grace mean? Scott Kisker from Wesley Seminary said that God's grace is the unmerited love of of God. It is God's reach toward you and me. It is when God pursues us, seeks us, looks for us. Last Sunday, Pastor Becky preached about grace and described the presence of grace in our lives 
in this way, prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. This is the way in our Wesleyan tradition, Wesleyan being John and Charles Wesley, who are the forefathers of Methodism, that they taught us and gave us these words to identify what it is in our lives. That is grace, that God's love is always with us. It is always among us, and it is always through us moving out ahead of us. That's prevenient grace, pre being to come before, even before you and I ever knew of God's love for us, God loved us. We read of this many times. In Romans 5, chapter, or verse 3, it says, God uh, demonstrates His love for you and me that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of His great love for you and me, has loved us even to death through our trespasses. He has made us alive through Christ Jesus because His grace has saved us. That's that prevenient grace, pre, to come before, before you and I ever owned it, acknowledged it, or even wanted it in our lives. God was wooing us with that love that He has for you and me, drawing us into God's presence. And then there's the justifying grace. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything has become new. Every time that you and I become aware of God's presence, His love for you and me, when we acknowledge that in that moment, it is a justifying moment. I think of it this way, just now, right now in this moment, I have experienced God's love and I'm aware of it. Now be cautious. There's not just one justifying moment. Sometimes we might think that a justifying moment happens when we become a follower of Jesus and we're baptized. Yes, those are justifying moments. But they happen again and again. I, I claim that there are many moments in every day of our lives that we can have those just now moments when we're aware of God's love. It washes over us. It's what I call waves of grace. And they come to us in some of the most unlikely and unexpected ways. And we experience them in real ways when we understand what God's love for us is. Let me give you an example. Pardon me if this seems a little crude, but I experienced God's grace this week. And the reason I experienced it, well, let me just tell you what the situation. I was, of all places in my house, I was in um, the restroom. <laughs> Hold on, it'll be okay. Go with me on this for a second. And while I was there, I experienced God's grace among, by all things, You know what that is, right? Okay. I have teenage boys in the house, and so we find these a lot. And what that is, is, of course, it's an empty toilet paper tube. And so I needed to replace the empty toilet paper tube, of course, with a fresh roll. And when I went to do it, I realized I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, usually the toilet paper, has the, the center piece, you just kind of squeeze it together. It's got a spring, and it pops out, and you put the new roll on, and then you put it back in, and you're good to go. This one didn't have that. I couldn't figure it out. The ends didn't unscrew. It was a solid metal bar, and I'm standing there for a minute or two or more, I don't know, trying to figure out, how do I change the toilet paper? And then I realized that it lifts up. It rotates on one of its axes, and then you slide the new one on and put it down. And I felt so stupid. I felt ridiculous because I couldn't change a roll of toilet paper. And it was in that moment, in that micro moment, that I realized the macro situation, and that was this. That Becky and I, my wife and I, and Pastor Becky and her family as well, and you to a certain extent, we are experiencing a situation where almost everything is new. I don't know how to do anything I didn't even know how to change the toilet paper in my own house. I don't know where I'm going to go get my hair cut or where to fill my prescriptions or where to take my car when i got to get the oil changed or the tire fixed. Everything is new and I feel so out of place and in some ways sometimes so alone. But here's grace. That in the midst of all of that, you as a community have been so welcoming and open and loving 
with my family and me and Pastor Becky and her family. You have prepared meals and sent them to our house the first week or so while we were here so that we didn't have to worry about how to find the dishes in all the boxes that we were surrounded by so we could cook something. And, and that was such a blessing. How the staff here has been so patient with me as I've tried to figure out things like how to put the toilet paper on the roll and how to not set the alarm off in the church building, which I did this morning. And you've been so patient, and it's been demonstrations of God's love and grace. You didn't have to. I, I've not earned it, obviously. Can't even remember Bob's name. <laughs> right, Bruce? <laughs> but you've been gracious. That's love. That's grace. Not when we earn it, not when we've deserved it, but when we've most needed it. God has loved us. God's love for you and me is grace. Above all else, have fervent love for one another. For 1 Peter, 4, verse, or 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, Love covers a multitude of sin. And so God has called you and me to lovingly respond to His great love for us. You see, the fruit of the Spirit that's described in Galatians is this. You know them, peace, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self, those, there's nine of them. But they all begin with the first one, which is love. The first fruit is love. And the other eight, then, I think are what Paul has done to demonstrate that those are actually embodiments of that first one, love. It can be said that all the other terms live through love. Joy, for example, is love exalting. Peace is love in repose. Long-suffering is love on trial. Gentleness is love in society. Goodness is love in action. Faith is love on the battlefield. Meekness is love at school. Temperance is love in training. So it's all love. Love at the top, and they move on to the bottom, and all along the way we experience love. In this, we know God's love, and that is grace. Not when we've earned it, not when we deserve it, but when God gives it to us freely and invites us then to freely give. You want to know God's love? You want to experience God's grace? You want to be able to see that thread of grace that is woven into the darkness of our world? Then be it! Be the grace that is God's love for you by sharing it with others. When I come to know God's love most clearly is when I'm offering it to others. When I'm forgiving those who haven't earned it, who don't deserve it, who maybe have not even asked for it, but yet I forgive them. That I don't return hate for hate. When I wave and smile at the guy on the road who tells me I'm number one. I offer grace, not giving what is deserved, but offering mercifully what is unearned. That's grace, God's love for us. And we're called to be that example in this world all around us. The Olympic swimming trials, as well as all the Olympic trials, have been going on. And I was watching some of them on television last week. And in the material, opening ourselves to grace, this example is given. Grace is like this. It's like a huge body of water. And if you go and jump in an open lake and just start swimming, and you swim for about 100 yards or so, when you raise up, you'll realize you didn't swim in a straight line most of the time. People either go to the left or the right because of our own strengths or tendencies, or maybe even sometimes in a circle. And if we're open, in the openness of God's grace without anything to guide us in that, we may find ourselves swimming in circles or getting off course. But if you watch the Olympic trials, in the swimming pool, they have the lanes are, are delineated. There are flotation devices that keep the lanes nice and straight. And when the swimmer is swimming and they're looking down at the bottom of the pool, have you ever noticed what's on the bottom of the pool? A thick black line, straight line that runs the length. That's to guide the swimmer so that while they're swimming, they can look down and know they're staying in their lane and staying straight. And then when they get to the end of the line, they get to the very end, what sometimes you'll see it as a T. There's a, a, a line across, perpendicular. 
and it indicates that they're at the end. But I've also seen it where that line goes just a little beyond it, and what does it form? A cross. That can remind us, and in this illustration of opening ourselves to grace, the authors remind us that it is the cross that is the goal for us. That we should forget, as Paul says, what lies behind and press on to take hold of that which God has taken hold of you and me with. And what is that? Grace. God's love. God holds us in His love and invites us to hold one another in that same love. And the best way that we can know grace is to extend grace to others. For all that is given to us is expected by God to be passed on. Otherwise, we cheapen grace. So I want to finish with that thought. That God invites us not to cheapen grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian who lived in Germany, fled and then went back to Germany and faced the Nazi regime and lost his life because of it, was martyred nonetheless stood up for what was right and loved in the face of that hatred. And this is what he said about cheap grace. Cheap grace is when we preach of forgiveness and yet refuse to offer it. When we have baptism without our discipline, when we have communion without confession, Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living incarnate in our lives. When we claim to follow Jesus but aren't willing to lay down our lives and take up that cross and follow Him daily. You see, costly grace is a treasure that is hidden in the field that the merchant is willing to go and sell everything for that he might have it. It is the great pearl that the price that is the merchant is willing to pay, to buy, that he might even give everything for it. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. Costly grace is that gift that is given to us because Jesus gave his life that we might give it, that we might have it in the full. I want to invite us, as I close, to ask ourselves, where are we experiencing God's grace? Where is the thread of love being woven into the tapestry of your life, no matter what you face as challenge? There's always a thread of grace. Sometimes it's easy to see it and know it, experience it. Sometimes it's harder. We sing of grace being amazing. You know the song, right? Amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. I am here to say as well that amazing grace can also sometimes be awful. A-W-E-F-U-L-L, full of awe and wonder. But it can also be awful, awful hard. Awful hard to forgive the one who has not earned it. Awful hard to extend love when we're faced with nothing but hate. Awful hard to do what's not easy to be done, but yet what Christ calls us to do. Let us be filled with grace in a way that the world out there is full of awe for that awful grace that is in us. Amen.